a few weeks ago, I was driving my children somewhere. I couldn't actually even tell you where because at some point, their social calendar totally eclipsed mine. But from the back seat, seemingly out of nowhere, my son asked me a question. He said, wasn't where do babies come from? I've got that handled. I can even just hand him my book if I need to. Um, it wasn't even what's happening in Israel or what's up with the president or anything like that. Those I could probably take stab at too. Instead, it was, Mommy, what is the stupidest thing you've ever done? <laughs> so I found myself a little bit flummoxed at the question. My mother would tell you that there's just too much to choose from. And if she was here right now, she would regale you with stories about how I didn't finish my PhD twice, how I had an orgasm while my brain was being scanned in an fMRI uh, scanner. That went viral on the internet. And then I decided to do it again on national television. She'd probably also mention the fact that I traveled across the Middle East and Africa while my ex-husband was deployed as a soldier with my infant son strapped to my back. And then probably every man I dated in my 20s. Unfortunately, she couldn't be here today. She had a previous engagement, so you're kind of stuck with me. But it wasn't actually wealth of choice that stopped me from answering my son. No, actually, what I took issue with was the word stupid. It's kind of a no-no word in our house. We don't use it anyway, but, you know, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, yes, I've made a few decisions in my life that had less than ideal immediate outcomes. Okay, maybe more than a few. But they were learning experiences. They taught me who I was, what the world was like. They taught me what to do. They taught me what never to do. And they got me to where I am today. So how could I call them stupid? How could I say they were crazy or ill-advised? They weren't. But what they were was risky. So we talk a lot about risk-taking. And a lot of times, we talk about it as if it's a bad thing, that stupid, that crazy. But let me ask you, the innovators and the great thinkers, do you consider yourself a risk taker? Do you think about the consequences of your actions when you make a decision? I see some of you nodding out there, and maybe some of you are thinking, yes, you know, I have this startup, or yes, I jump out of planes, or hey, I love to gamble on the weekends. And while those are risky behaviors, those aren't risks themselves. Risk, at its simplest, is just making a decision where you don't know the outcome. It's uncertain. And when you think about it, every single decision you make, every single day, is a risky one. Because in this life, there's very little that is guaranteed. As scientists are learning more about the importance of risk-taking and the fact that it is part and parcel of everyday decision-making, they're realizing it's really important for learning, for memory. And Part of that is a nice little circuit in the brain called the, called the mesocortical limbic circuitry. Now, I apologize in advance to the neurogeeks out there. I only have 14 minutes, so I can't go into all the pieces of it. But the two main pieces that seem to be important when it comes to both risk and reward processing are an area of the brain called the basal ganglia. That is also called the reptilian brain. It's nestled deep near the base of the skull. And it was part of the brain that Nora Volkow was talking about earlier. This is where we want rewards. This is what Joshua Buckholz, who is a researcher at Harvard University, calls the gas. It's our motivator. It wants us to go out and get good sex and good food and money and prestige and all the best things in life. But of course, if we went after those things without consideration for the world around us, life would be pretty inhospitable. So we also have a second part of that circuit, our prefrontal cortex right up here in this big developed part of our brain, the seat of executive function, reason. And Buchholz calls that the brakes. So in this circuit, when we're faced with a risky decision, these two pieces of the circuit kind of dance, they kind of quarrel, disagree with each other. Do you go after the things that you want? Do you hit that gas and go? Or, no, no, take a step back, hit the brakes. Now isn't the time. You don't want to have sex with him or her, 
you probably don't want to eat that food either. So what's interesting about this circuit is that it's fueled in part by the neurochemical dopamine. And it's known as the pleasure chemical, and it's certainly something that's released in the brain when we do encounter something pleasant. Um, and in fact, it's involved with learning, memory, sex, drug addiction. In fact, there's very little it's not involved in. Uh, and it gets called up so much that Von Bell, a science writer, once called it the Kim Kardashian of neurotransmitters. <laughs> you know, the thing is, I don't think it's a comparison that does either one of them justice. Um, but it's there, and when we do encounter something that's pleasurable, a reward, dopamine is released. So hopefully we learn to go after it so we can eat, so we can procreate, so we can sort of you know, keep our social standing. But research out of Michael Frank's lab at Brown University has shown us something interesting. We seem to get more dopamine when the reward we get is unexpected. When we risk and when we get this reward when we didn't expect it, dopamine goes gangbusters. And the release of that neurochemical helps to shape this circuit and helps you to better gain the experience to know when you should hit the gas or pump the brakes. So what does this have to do with play? Well, some of this research is what's behind the whole free-range kids movement. And we've already heard a lot about the importance of recess and play, and it seems like you can't open the New York Times without some kind of editorial about, let's let kids climb high structures, let's them, let them swing from trees, stop helicoptering, you know, let them take risks. Why? Because it helps them to learn. It helps them to build you know, uh, problem-solving skills. It helps them to take initiative. It helps them to better regulate their emotions and work with others. All very valuable skills. When we talk about teens, we also talk a lot about risk-taking. Um, and you know, it's funny, that's when we start to use those words again. Stupid, crazy, uh, ill-advised. But in fact, what work out of Larry Steinberg's uh, lab out of Temple University is showing us is that teens are kind of the ultimate risk takers. What's happening at puberty as their brain is developing into adulthood kind of sets up that circuit for lots of gas, not so much breaks. They lack the experience at that point for adulthood to know when to take risks or stay off. And so you find that when every kid, every teen, no matter how demure, is going to take more risks, but when they have safe arenas, when they have play arenas, like music, like theater, like sports, in which to take those risks, they get those same kind of skills again. They learn how to emotionally regulate. They learn how to deal with the world around them. They learn how to work well with others. So again, play and risk is a benefit. So given that kids seem to be getting all this, you know, encouragement to get out there and, you know, get dirty. Why shouldn't adults get the same benefits? Why are we supposed to be grown-ups and responsible and stop taking risks exactly? Some of it's kind of a scientific artifact, although psychologists have known for a long time that you can teach an old dog new tricks. It used to be thought that the brain stopped, you know, changing around 25 years of age. Ding, brain was done, you couldn't get value from it. But of course, now, neuroscientists are showing that their brain is remarkably plastic all through life. So those same benefits that kids get from risk free play, adults can too. The other thing is that it comes back down to that negative nuance. It's stupid, it's crazy. And you know, a couple years ago, I sort of found myself in this midlife crisis in reverse. I wasn't taking risks. I had recently gotten divorced. I had a mortgage to pay, a kid to take care of. And I stopped playing because I thought I had to be responsible. And I think for many of us, especially the overachievers type, that's how we feel like we have to be. We have to sit, we have to be still. But while I realized I was actually paying my mortgage and kind of doing the same things I you know, needed to do, all the things I needed to do, it wasn't much fun. And I wasn't really learning anything new either. So where can you get these play benefits? Risky play. Now, a lot of people will talk about what's something called deliberative pra deliberate practice. Now, that's boring. It's basically working at the edge of your performance ability. 
It's when a pianist picks a piece that is really, really hard and fails over and over and over again until, boom, somehow they get it. This is something that musicians, athletes, chess players, they know to do this. Work at the edge of the uh, performance ability. Risky play is going to up their skill set. Neuroscientist at Karolinska Institute, Frederick Ullen, found that pianists who do this kind of deliberate practice get a huge brain benefit. He found their brains showed more myelination. Now, this is sort of like brain insulation. And what it does is it helps to speed up brain signals from part to part in the brain, from synapse to synapse. It helps optimize the signaling in your brain. And you think that some of that might be just in motor cortex, right? Because after all, it's finger stuff. But no, where he found it was frontal cortex, where you have the brakes. So it's helping you to get the information there so you can figure out whether to take the risk, keep pushing, or stop. We also see this with physical athletes. Work from Scott Grafton at UCSB has shown that working at that edge for athletes really helps them out. It helps them figure out where their body is in space. And for every time that they fall down and get back up again, they have a much better representation of how to move, where to put their hand, how to grip. It improves their performance and helps them to better allocate their cognitive resources so they can get the job done, so they can improve their game. Work from other researchers has shown similar things with attention, with working memory. Risky play has benefits. Risky play helps you get out there. And of course, I'm leaving out probably the most important benefit, which is that play is fun. You're doing something you love to do. You're motivated. You want to get up there. When you fall down seven times, you're going to get up eight. So you're going to master those skills. And you're going to optimize your cognitive performance. So am I saying that if you go out and take on that super hard rock wall, you're going to get a better performance review next time you're at work? Well, again, why are we always pushing teens to risk in those playful arenas, in music, in sports? It's not just so they get into Harvard, although that would be nice. We're doing it because those skills transfer. Does being on a championship lacrosse team make you better management material? Does dancing a solo part in the Nutcracker teach you more about self-discipline? Does running a marathon help you hone your physique? Yes. And these, again, skills that transfer. So you may be wondering what I finally answered my son, the stupidest thing I ever did. I didn't actually answer him, because I want to continue the conversation about there's a big difference between stupid and risk, and to encourage him to take risks, to think about them, to fail, to learn from his mistakes, and to get better. And you know, in the meantime, I'm sure my mom has all kinds of stuff that she can tell him. So I'd like to leave you with sort of two action items. The first is, especially with adults, let's take away play shame. We do have time. This is an important skill. So, you know, let's stop with the stupid and the ill-advised and go out there, you know, and push the envelope a little. And that's the second call to action. Play. Challenge that guy at the park who makes all those other old men cry to a game of chess learn a new language, and then insist that the barista behind the desk at Starbucks talk to you in that language. Learn how to tango, climb, run, fall down, get back up. Choose to take risks and play so that you are better equipped to learn how to solve problems, to regulate your emotions, to deal with stress, to work with others. Choose to risk and play so when risk chooses you, as so often happens in life, you're better equipped to deal with that too. Thank you. <laughs>